Hello. Uh, I decided to do a, there she goes right away. Like clockwork as soon as I start recording something. Anyway, <laughs> I thought it might be useful and helpful to people if I did a q and I kind of fall behind on a lot of my um, Tumblr questions. So I figured I would take some questions from people on Twitter and try to answer them as best as I could. So I've thought about these a little bit, but not a ton. So we'll see how it goes. All right. First of all, I will start with a question from That Damned Panda. Is there anything in BG3 that made you think, man, that would be cool to add to Pillars 3 if it ever got made? Uh, you know, the thing is, as a game developer, a lot of times when I look at games, uh, you know, I, I can't really play them without trying to break down how they're doing what they're doing. And a lot of the success of BG3 is uh, very good execution. <laughs> it's, it's features we've seen before, but very well executed. Uh, the things that I do think stand apart in BG3 that I personally would like to incorporate into like a fantasy, a party-based fantasy game, a pillarsy game, uh, I think movement, the way that movement works, the jumping, um, the ability to fly, basically to move through the terrain in more than just walking around. I think that does add a lot to not only the feeling of the world, but the player has a lot more options for how to approach situations and solve problems. And it gives you the ability to give the player tools that augment those things. And uh, yeah, I mean, those are really fun things in tabletop and to see them represented in, you know, a CRPG is very cool. So that is a big part of it. Um, and then the way that they, there's just a very dynamic world. So the fact that the world has so much dynamis, dynamism in it mechanically. So there's a lot of different things you can do with properties, things being wet or burning or what have you. Um, the ability to pick up so many objects and move them around or break through anything. That sort of dynamism is very, very cool. Obviously, in uh, Pillars and Deadfire, we have mostly 2D worlds, and so that's uh, a lot more difficult to sort of uh, make happen. But even in a 3D world, it's not easy. You know, they were building on their success with Original Sin 2, which is very cool. And uh, yeah, but those are the things that I think really make, let's say at least those two layering games really stand out and BG3 uh, really feel like a very, very dynamic world uh, that you can explore in a lot of interesting ways. All right, so the next question is from Nad. Are you interested in telling more stories in the medium you've made Pentiment? I think I understand what you mean. And when it comes to the development, are you more proud of the writing and everything that went into it or the unique way you told the writing with its special gameplay? Big fan. Thank you. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm uninterested in, you know, making more games of that type. I feel like, you know, it wasn't like I was trying to prove a point or make a new type of game or anything. I had an idea for a historical narrative game and this is kind of what came out. And I I guess I'm proud of the total package, right? Like, I know that sounds maybe like evasive, but um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to portray the range of characters we were with the, I hope the amount of nuance that we wanted to uh, a lot of complicated ideas um, expressed by people with a lot of different levels of education and a lot of opinions. And mechanically, I wanted to keep it really light and still feel RPG-ish in a way, but um, not really put off people that don't know anything about RPGs or might not know anything about games. So I'm really just happy about how everything came together in it, which... I think the older I get, the more or the more time I spend in the industry, which are one and the same, I guess now. But um, it's about how everything comes together. That's what really kind of counts. And um, while I wouldn't be opposed to the idea of making another game like it, let's say in that sort of narrative heavy stat light way, uh, it's not something that I'm like, dying to do or anything. So uh, I'm really happy with the work that we did. 
Uh, Serdar Ersuz. Excuse me, I, I can't really pronounce Turkish very well, so I did look it up, so I apologize if I butchered it. Um, do you have a specific tool, specific format or tool for creating the game narrative or a special process you go through? Um, nothing like super formal. I, there's no tool that I use. Um, I try to keep most of my notes pretty light, to be honest. I try to keep most of my writing for the game <laughs> or explaining, but not documenting. Um, I to keep the documents relatively light, which isn't to say non-existent, uh, but really to the point. I really want to make a, you know, like if I describe the story, it's not going to be an excruciating detail usually. Um, even characters, like most of the characters in the Pentiment Confluence, which is where, where we stored all of our stuff for the game, uh, their descriptions were two to three sentences, maybe five. You know, the main characters got a paragraph. And by main, I mean like three characters got a paragraph and then everyone else got a few sentences and the rest of it was to be sort of worked out between the narrative designers and uh, developed in the game. So as far as how I conceive of things, you know, it might start with the idea of an inciting event <clears throat> or a, a set of themes that I want to explore. I'm a very visual person. And so often I will think of images and there's sort of a, a series of images that kind of form some sort of loose arc over the course of a story, a game. And I think about how those things could kind of come together, uh, the characters that would be in those images. I know this might sound really weird and abstract, but um, I also think of characters very visually. Often I start with a very vague concept of a character in terms of their their position in the story, their vocation maybe, and then there's a strong appearance element and then their personality kind of comes in over that. But often I'm starting with like names and images and a very loose idea and I work down from there. Um, when I started on Penitent, I started with a, with characters really. <clears throat> and I had some idea of where I was gonna go with the story, but it was pretty loose. And uh, yeah, I just started with the monastics. I started with monks, I started with nuns, and then I started moving on to townsfolk. And I was very happy when I was watching some documentary videos with Umberto Eco, who is the author of The Name of the Rose, which is a big inspiration for Pentiment. And he said that when he started on Name of the Rose, which was his, his first novel, which is incredible, um, he just started with a list of names of monks and then developed it from there, which I, I was like, oh, okay, that's not too far off from how I do it. Noah Todd asked, how did working in theater affect your later game direction? You know, it's it affected it in a couple of ways. So I, I, I did theater in middle school and then into high school, and then I went to college for music and theater initially. Um, and then I dropped out of the conservatory and I did, I got a history degree, but I was stayed involved in theater, um, both standard drama and also uh, musical theater. And I did direct a student musical uh, called Assassins by Stephen Sondheim my junior year. And there are a couple of things that it taught me. As an actor, you know, um, just performances and lines and line reading and thinking about intonation and speaking the words that you write out loud. I wasn't a playwright or anything in college, but you know, I understood the imp how important specificity of words, uh, how powerful that can be. And so I think that I learned to respect the word and especially dialogue a lot. I don't think I'm really much of a prose person. Um, and then directing Assassins, uh, it turned out well, but I don't think I did a particularly good job. I didn't know what I was doing. So I made a lot of mistakes as I was doing it. And we had a very uh, passionate group of people working on it. And I would say that maybe my passion for the, my passion for the musical kind of uh, papered over all of my um, incompetence as a director <laughs> and, voc uh, and the vocal coach for the cast, which was crazy because I was the music school dropout. But at that time, the, the voice teachers didn't want to be involved with it because it was a student production. So I, I was the voice coach, which is ludicrous. 
But um, I learned a lot just about like what I didn't know and ways that I can screw up and that I need to do better at as a leader and as a people, as a, as a person managing a lot of people. Um, I have responsibility to them. So, uh, and I would say, you know, prior to that, I had had some leadership positions at the university and in my fraternity, and I didn't do a particularly good job with those either. And so I was starting to sense a pattern of like, I'm really not actually very good at this. I need to, uh, I need to step back and, and think about how I'm doing this. So uh, that helped a lot. And then, but also being a director, there were certain things where vision and creative problem solving, we were working on a not tiny budget, but not a huge budget. And we had to get really creative about where would the orchestra go in the, in the, it was a very small theater. So like, where are they even going to go? They're going to overpower everything on stage if they're between the audience and the stage. So we put them on a raised platform behind the set, which was crazy <laughs> that we had to build back there. Um, and just all sorts of things. So it, it really did teach me a lot about being a director. And then, you know, a lot of, a lot of cinema and theater is still present in, in games and role-playing games. So it helps. Uh, Jorge Silva said, thanks for the opportunity to ask you a question. You've been involved in different RPGs, Fallout, Icewind Dale, Pillars, of course. Is there a setting or specific RPG that you would want to make a new RPG? Uh, and then I will go, I will tile this into the next one from Pong Soul. Good evening, Josh. If you were able to make Alpha Protocol 2 today, what ideas what ideas off the top of your head would, would you have for it? Any behind the scenes stories you can share from the making of the original? So I, I do think it would be cool, and I've said this before, I, I think that it would be very cool to make to make a spy RPG again. I think tonally where my interests lie are not quite where Alpha Protocol was. I think structurally Alpha Protocol was fantastic. I can't take any credit for it. By the way, just to be clear, I worked on um, the close quarters combat system. I, I sort of took it over at the end and uh, did the best I could with it. And um, otherwise, I'd, I wasn't involved in the story, but I always thought it was very cool how they approached conversation and storytelling. And um, so I like the idea of spy stories. I like Cold War era spy stories. Uh, tonally, you know, stuff like Tinker Tailor. Uh, that's... That's kind of my jam. So I do have a question though, which is, um, you know, someone brought up to me the idea that uh, the spy genre feels kind of Gen X-ish. Like maybe that's the last generation that's like super into the idea of spies and espionage. And maybe it is, maybe it is because the Cold War has, has ended. Um, or maybe there are other reasons. How would I know? I, I am a Gen X person. But um, there's a possible observation that the spy genre is not particularly interesting to a, a wide audience, let's say. So I think it would be really cool. Um, you know, I get a lot of ideas from things like the Hitman series, which obviously because they're leaning more into 007 now, uh, there were a lot of elements that felt very, very Bondy, which I thought was cool. Um, so yeah, I think I think a spy game personally would be very interesting. There's a lot of games that I, I think would be cool, but because contemporary settings are not often done, and uh, Alpha Protocol was one of the, the few games that actually did that. Uh, I think that would be a cool thing to work on personally. And then the last question I have here from Nicholas uh, Armorim. What was it like creating a game like Pentiment with thousands of thousands of references and period books? Did you and his team read them all? Um, no, we did not read them all. I'm, uh, I'm not uh, that sort of a reader, <laughs> typically. <laughs> I'm a very... Uh, get to the point sort of reader and a lot of, especially in academic stuff. So, you know, we have a bibliography at the end of Pentiment and, you know, everything that's in that bibliography, those are all things that we on the team referenced. In most cases, that was Zoe or uh, I referenced it, Zoe Franznick or I, uh, because we had the historical background um, and the sort of language backgrounds to kind of look into that stuff. And then we also did have consultants. We had three PhD consultants, uh, Christopher DeHamel, who is a world-renowned expert on manuscript production, Edmund Kern, who is my advisor uh, at Lawrence University when I was getting my history degree, and Winston E. Black, 
um, who specializes in medieval medicine. And I know we're a little later, but early Renaissance medicine was still medieval medicine. And he was a classmate of mine at Lawrence. So they, you know, those are the, the real, the true academics. So we used those, um, you know, academic articles. We also used the books. But in a lot of cases, you know, I would find out about something in a book and I would just laser focus and go to what I wanted because I, we had a game to make. So I would try to really get to the point and, um, you know, find out what I needed to find out because I didn't really have the luxury to sit and read. And some of these, by the way, some of these books were, um, they're real dry. <laughs> they're very academic. And uh, some of them were not in English. So there were a few that I had to read in German. And uh, I am fluent in German, but academic German is way like it's deep into native speaker territory and it was pretty rough. So I, I, I couldn't quite digest the whole books there. I had to to get what I needed and then get out while, while I was sane. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we did our best. I think we did a pretty good job and we always make errors. I try to remind myself that, uh, even Umberto Eco made errors in Name of the Rose. So if, uh, if, if Umberto could make errors, I have to be a little forgiving to myself. All right. I think that wraps it up for this Q and A. I hope this was useful. I'll, I'll see how people like this one. And if people like it, then I will run another one in the future. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.